I'm honored to be here, and I will speak as a physician, but probably more as a patient. And the reason I would like to tell you my story is to tell you where I came from and how I got to where I am. And I think that our stories help us make sense of the world, because it's with our stories that we can actually tell what's real, what's true, and, and what's possible. And so I start with my career, which did not have a glamorous beginning. I actually started with poop. And that's what we're doing. We're looking at stool samples in northern India through a World War II field microscope. But at the, on this trip as a medical student, I also was introduced to some of the greatest mountains in the world. And so I'll just tell you where I came from, because I got addicted to the mountains just as badly as I got addicted to medicine. So I was able to do residency here, which put me near the Cascades. Then I got a job as a senior registrar in New Zealand. And I was able to come back the long way through Nepal, India, and Europe before I started practice in Wenatchee, Washington, and finally started making some money. And so with money, I could travel. And my vacations were to the mountains. And this is kind of what I did for many years of my life until this climb on Cho'oyu. And after this climb, an old football injury totally wore out my right knee. And I could hardly walk for several years until my partner finally replaced that knee. And that actually was about two weeks before Jens and I did this TB case of the spine. But I was able with that knee that same year in 1997 to return to this mountain, Ama de Blom, and climb it to become a poster child for joint arthroplasty. Uh, I didn't quite summit on it, but I did sell this slide to Johnson & Johnson for a thousand bucks. And it was a wonderful thing to be able to share the mountains with my sons as well. And I tell you that story, all those stories, because I, I wanted to tell you that I thought my life had taught me something about doing things that were hard. But I can tell you now that hard is being here in a wheelchair. This is a harder climb than any mountain I've, I've ever been on. And it was unbelievable that I knew very little about this side of spinal cord injury. But one of the things that was incredibly important and fortunate for me was that during these years, I was able to recruit a young spine surgeon to join me in Wenatchee. So there were two of us actually doing spine trauma. The other thing that was very fortunate was that I got him into riding a bicycle. And so my whole life changed in 2008. And it turns out that his name is Hank, Hank Bavoda. Some of you may know him. But I had the habit of riding to the bicycle to work in the OR, and he would go to the hospital and then ride the bike back to our office. So we always passed each other going in opposite directions. And one morning in October at dawn, a security guard who was getting off work suddenly crossed the center line on the road and hit me head on. Went through the windshield, fell in front of the car. He crushed me into a bank. And it turns out I was unconscious and not breathing. And the first person on the scene was my partner who was riding his bike. And that happened to be the exact time we were going to pass each other. And so he established my airway, got me breathing again, and essentially saved my life simply because he was a spine surgeon I had recruited who happened to be riding his bicycle on that road at that time on that day. You, you can't make this stuff up. And, and so I was then in the ER, and the workup revealed a fracture C2, this fracture, dislocation at T4-5, a crushed chest, and you were talking about the four columns. My sternum was completely dislocated. Almost all my ribs were broken. And um, I had four chest tubes that were pouring blood. And so for me, just a few hours after my accident, I was wheeled into the operating room where I was supposed to be the surgeon. But I was a patient. And my partner became my surgeon. And I can tell you that I, I, this talk, my experience is going to touch on many of the things that you guys have been talking about today. In terms of timing of surgery, if I had been airlifted over here to Harborview, I probably would have died in transit because I, lost, I had to get four, 15 units of blood transfused in the first few hours 
after my accident. And so it was, it was really, uh, timing of surgery for me was life-saving in that it was immediate. And your paper that came out in 2006 showed that early stabilization of thoracic spinal fractures was significantly better in terms of survival. My numbers looked good enough that I got extubated and then I sat through an open nasotracheal intubation as I went into respiratory failure that was so bad that I was intubated for a month. And I spent six weeks in the ICU, six weeks in rehab before I went home. And, um, and I can tell you that when you go home after a spinal cord injury, that's when everything gets hard. Because you see, it's normal to be abnormal in the hospital, right? I mean, and on the rehab ward, it's even normal to be paraplegic. But when you get home, it's unbelievable to realize that nothing in your life will ever be normal again. Not any of the normal daily things will ever be normal. And one of the harsh realities for me, because I'm an old guy now, is the, the reality that there's no treatment for spinal cord injury. There are some research projects that are going on, but I had been telling people for 25 years that I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do to make your paralysis better, and now I was living that, and I want to share with you the perspective from my own career. Because when I was a medical student, we had antibiotics that could treat most bacterial infections. And, and then as a senior medical student, I did an a, a elective at Fred Hutchinson Institute here, and they were getting good at bone marrow transplants with stem cells. The next year as an intern, I took care of patients that were getting organ transplants. And during that time, open heart surgery was becoming commonplace. Even hearts were being transplanted. And look at the incredible explosion of what we can do with spinal instrumentation and orthopedics. My own knee took me back to Ama de Blanc. And then cancer care. In the last 20 years, there's been an explosion of treatment options for people with cancer. And in my experience now, it's running about 50% that of cancer cases that can be treated successfully or even cured. But when you get a spinal cord injury and become paralyzed, we're saying the same things to patients now that we said 50 or 60 years ago. It's the one area where we are no further ahead after over half a century. We, we can get, we're getting better at keeping paralyzed patients alive, but we can't make them better. They get better wheelchairs, but no hope of repair. And so that's something that stands out. And, and I'll, if I have time, I'll say a few comments about why I think that's so. But it, it's almost embarrassing what we can't do. But there I was. I went home, I was in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, and one of the first things that was shocking to me was how important trunk control is. Because I, as a surgeon, had kind of grouped all thoracic injuries together. And I'm T1 on my right side, and I'm T4 on the other. And you can see the big transection of my cord where it was torn totally apart. And so when I went home, I couldn't believe that I couldn't do something with two hands in front of me without putting one hand down. So the thought of going back to operating or doing any projects, I'm just amputating my right arm because it just became a leg. So high thoracic injuries, believe me, they have a totally different life than low thoracic injuries with trunk control. And that was uh, an incredible thing to realize. The other thing that I realized as I went back and tried to make sense of life, I realized how important our connections to others are because you can't do this alone. And I have been blessed in a community where every act of kindness I did for 25 years before I got hurt has come back to me tenfold. And these connections give meaning to life. I've really come to believe that. The other thing I've come to realize is that exercise is a miracle drug. 
I mean, it, it really is. And I was lucky enough to have a group of people come together to form the EDS training program, and that has nothing to do with my name. It means every damn day, because we really do get out every day and exercise. And in fact, our slogan is, I'm just a bike ride away from a better mood. And those of you who run and exercise know what I'm talking about. It really is critical, and many of us can't do it without a team. And when this when the snow was too deep to, to ride a bike, I had the same team that was able to help me Nordic ski, which again gives exercise and something that has, has meaning doing it with other people. The other thing that came into my life was a nurse I'd worked with for 20 years, and she became a partner. And we had a pretty good session until she started having headaches for the first time in her life. And I won't belabor it, but a biopsy of the tissue mass around her thoracic spinal cord showed meningeal gliomatosis. And so two years after my own accident, I became a caregiver for the person that was going to take care of me as she became a high thoracic paraplegic. And what that did for me was surprise me because I no longer had time to think about myself somebody else's life had become more important than my own life. And all of a sudden, by becoming a caregiver, I started taking care of myself. And I went back to work as a physician, and what I realized is that simply by being a better listener and taking care of people, I had a sense of purpose in my life. And every kindness, every time I put other people first, I felt better. In fact, I've come to believe that putting others first is a great switch that changes everything in your life. And, and for me, it was healing. And, and it brought a sense of purpose back into my life. And so what, one of the lessons for me that I would like to tell all of you, because everybody's going to have to go through something. You're, you're not going to get out of here alive. And, and you may not find the meaning and the purpose that you thought you were searching for in life, but meaning and purpose can find you if you remain open to it. And, and I'm an old guy now, as I said, and the only thing I'm going to have to do is try to figure out how to make it, because nobody's going to enroll me in a research project. But I can tell you that I think there are some positive things that are happening in the world of spinal cord injury, and they're happening in other countries much more quickly than they are here. But we do have um, kind of a multifaceted, from my perspective, I'm, I'm not doing the research, but I think it's going to be multifaceted. And you could tell by looking at my spinal cord, one of the first things that if I was ever going to get better, I would need is some kind of scaffold. And in vivo therapeutics, is actually putting together a polymer scaffolding. And they're, they're working with venture capital, and it's, it's still in its early stages, but they seem to be, in the 16 patients they've used it in, they've had a much higher than natural history conversion rate for another, another, Asia, a, another Asia grade of spinal cord improvement. So I think there's going to be a scaffolding. I think there'll be a cellular element and there are different people working with different stem cells, everything from stem cell tourism with mesenchymal stem cells, which are really kind of totally a shot in the dark, to really interesting work with, with fetal brain cells. And I'll tell you this story about Stem Cells, Inc., because this is something that is illustrative of some of the barriers to development in our own country. Stem Cells, Inc. was the darling of Wall Street because it was a venture capital company, and I have spent several, almost a couple of hours or so, talking with Eileen Anderson, who was the principal investigator. She was working with fetal brain cells, and she actually found that they could grow fetal brain cells in culture, and she had three populations that were forming synapses in sheets, and they implanted those in 12 complete Asia A thoracic injuries and seven of them improved one to two grades. And so they were really hot to do the cervical study. 
and she had three populations of fetal brain cells that were forming clumps. They weren't forming synapses. She talks about these cells like they're her students. And she clearly told the, the people who had the venture capital, we should not do the cervical study. These cells are not behaving the way they should. And it turns out that in America, with venture capital supporting the research, they all want a two-year ROI now. A five-year return on investment is no longer acceptable in America. They want a two-year ROI. So they forced her to go ahead with a cervical study. It was a bust. She could have told them it was going to be a bust. And so in May of 2016, Stem Cells, Inc. was a darling of Wall Street. Its stock was taken off. In July of 2016, Stem Cells, Inc. went bankrupt. And there was a bunch of financial mis misadventure within the, country, within the company. And so in America, where we keep trying to get these people into the research who want to make money and make it quickly, um, we're not going to see successful research. But the fact that fetal brain cells in seven out of 12 patients brought significant improvement is something that I think we should all keep in mind for the future. And then there's electrical stimulation of the spinal cord that I think is going to be really something. And Chet Moritz here at University of Washington has shown incredible improvement in a C5 quadriplegic with hand function simply by stimulating his spinal cord, which brings me to the point of our incredible lack of knowledge about what is the spinal cord and how does it work. Because I have had my own experience with locomotor training. And can we run the video there? And this is me back in, I think, 2013. And you can see that I'm working on a treadmill. I'm T1 on one side and T4 on the other. But when my hip is pulled into extension, my leg will come out and, dors and flex my knee and dorsiflex my foot. And so when you're talking about stimulating the diaphragm and getting the diaphragm to sort of work, this is something that convinces me that there's electrical activity in that spinal cord that, that we don't yet know about because we haven't been able to study it. And then in 2014, I went down to Exobionics at Berkeley and met the people who branched off from the Hulk, the human load, universal load carrier. You saw the picture on CNN, the military guy. One of the engineers had a brother that became a paraplegic and branched off into exobionics. And we were able to bring the exoskeleton to Confluence Health in 2014. This device has the sensory function to sense the person's effort and then complete the step. And so we have been using it with strokes, with MS, all of the patients that you were describing. We treat 40 to 50 patient sessions a month. And the results in incomplete injuries, not me, I have that huge gap. But we've had incomplete spinal cord injuries that were headed to a nursing home now be ambulating and be able to walk. And what I understand from the people that are looking at this even though we can't cut open the spinal cord and do the research, people are talking about a population of neurons in the lateral columns that they're calling interneurons. And they're thinking that these neurons may be capable of forming new synapses between the dorsal columns, sensory, and the ventral columns, the motor columns. Because what we see here is a learning of patients with incomplete injury that's almost unbelievable. And can we run the video? Will it go? And so here I am, a high thoracic paraplegic. And this machine is walking for me. And we walk, just like you, 30 to 45 minutes in a session. Um, I've gotten over 2,000 steps. And we are, I can tell you that the comment about people who stand up and you get to look in the eye, if, when, when, a, when someone comes in and uses our exoskeleton and their family is there and they stand up and walk, you don't have to explain anything to anybody about how beneficial this is. And so what I want to see are the papers that are using and looking at this technology for bone density. And we are currently doing a Doppler study of arterial blood flow to study the actual blood flow to the lower extremities before and after these walking sessions.
Because just like you said, 60 sessions, done. Nobody believes that this is beneficial for you to continue. And yet, which of you would walk for 60 sessions and then say, hey, it's OK. I'm going to sit down for the rest of my life. And so we're fighting the whole insurance model and understanding and Medicare, everything you can imagine that, like Jens, you said there's no C CPT code, right? And the, this, this, this is so new, it has not been accepted. And yet we have seen miracles in patients with incomplete injury in our little old situation over in Wenatchee, Washington, where we've now, we're going on to our fourth year of this program. And we've got patients that come from Seattle and Issaquah and Idaho and Montana to Wenatchee to walk in this. And I can't believe that it hasn't become more standard therapy because the benefits of it are incredible. And like I say with my cyclist, I'm a bike ride away from a better mood. Well, I can tell you that I get to do this twice a week and I'm just a walk away from a better mood. And so those are some of the things that I can tell you as a patient. And some of the directions that I would hope faculty and researchers will go. And I just hope to high heaven that the NIH will allow stem cell research once again, because it was vetoed single-handedly in 2004 and 2007 by our president, and it's never come back to the NIH. Venture capital is not the right place for stem cell research. And I think the problem is that we keep looking at short-term profits and make them more important than the long-term cost to society. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Ed. Uh, so this is an amazingly inspirational story of human survival and uh, making a difference uh, for yourself and making a difference for so many others. Uh, no question, uh, your reputation and your importance is still unparalleled and will continue to grow, I'm sure, because it takes uh, people like you to bring forth that there's a difference to be made. The, the interesting thing is the gal that introduced me in, in 2014 at Exobionics, Amanda Boxtel, has been named a CNN hero for 2018. She's taken it away from this model of insurance, Medicare, and, and that kind of reimbursement. She's gotten it into a gym and signed up physical therapists to be trainers. And so in Aspen, they've got an exoskeleton program that's run out of a gym with physical therapists who have become athletic trainers for the people. And she's offering it through a foundation that, uh, called Bridging Bionics Foundation. And it is helping people pay for something that I mean, like I said, who's going to say they'll stop walking, you know? I mean, it's just not, it's not good for you to stop walking. I can tell you that. So. Any questions or comments? Let me ask you one other question. So the big um, kind of cool topics for a society as we're in right now is cancer and is heart disease. And they get a lot of money. Yet in our society of about uh, 360 million, I think we have about depending upon the definition, if you include myelopathy, somewhere between five and maybe 10 million people have some form of a paralyzing disorder in their life. It may be way more if you include stroke. And add the ages in for some of those. Yeah. So, so why is paralysis um, not more kind of cool and up there as a major uh, issue? You identified the profit motive, but I still fail to grasp the idea of that the spine has never been recognized as an organ system, which it should be, and the terribly disabling uh, capacity it has, especially with paralysis. I can tell you that, and I don't know about some of the other neurological diseases, because I was a spine surgeon and dealt with spinal cord injury, but we all, as spine surgeons, know that the large demographic are younger people in their 20s and 30s who are doing something stupid, either diving off something or getting drunk and getting in an accident, and they end up on welfare. And look at the difference of people who are on welfare in terms of reimbursement. So are you going to put together a company and, and a whole project to try to get, get service to someone who's on welfare and get paid 30% of your costs? You know, or are you going to let the people who will go to Cancer Care Centers of America who have IRAs and retirement accounts and all the money that they made in life 
to spend on their care once they have been through a productive life. And so, and the stats are 80% of the people who are spinal cord injured are on welfare, on Medicaid, and there's no money. What do you tell patients? Because one of our big jobs is to give patients hope, realistic hope, honest hope, but hope. What do you tell patients when they come to you, because they come to me literally weekly, and go like, I want to have some stem cells. Where can I go? Should I go to Mexico? Should I go to China? What do you tell them about that? That's very interesting, because my sister just had stem cells injected in her hip. Um, and in our, I can't speak to neurosurgery, because I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon, but in orthopedics, we have had plea after plea to study stem cells so that we know which cells, for which purpose, how they should be prepared, and we put together data. Because right now, it is the business model, entrepreneurs, and some people seem to get results. But as a profession of orthopedic surgeons, we can't tell you exactly which cells for which problem, exactly how they should be prepared, with or without PRP and with or without all kinds of other additives, and we don't have any long-term data or results. And I don't know why that is, because there's something there that I think could give people hope. When Ed made his comment about the NIH, John, you nodded your head. Why was that? Do you remember? No? OK. I misunderstood. Uh, you're nodding off. No, you're not nodding off. OK, John, you had a comment? No, I, I, I am curious about your your talk about electrical stimulation, and this is purely anecdotal, but I found it interesting. We, we had a young girl who had a high quad. She was C1, C2, black signal in the cord. I mean, severe cord signal, not transected. She was in Asia A when she left the hospital, uh, which to, to rehab, which was 10 days maybe after hospitalization. So Asia A at 10 days. No sensory. She was awake, alert, and she was one of the interesting ones. I asked about the the uh, diaphragmatic pacer because they put a diaphragmatic pacer in her like two days after her injury, and she was off the vent almost right away. Like when she left for rehab, she was not vent dependent. She was purely on a spinal cord, and that that girl walks now, and she went to rehab about a about. Two, three weeks into rehab, sent me a video of her starting to fire her legs, and she walks. And she was in Asia A at 10 days. Have you ever seen that? I, I mean, that girl walks, John, and she's spastic, I and had, she walks. I had an epidural stimulator put in, off-label. I paid cash for it because of what happened through the University of Louisville. They had five patients that all regained function with an implantable. You showed the picture of the spinal cord stimulator. Yeah. Well. When they put them in, it seems like there's something that happens, and again, it comes back to neurons in the spinal cord that can form new synapses that we don't know anything about. But I can tell you that when I had it put in, I was starting to get electrical sensations below the level of my injury, and nine days after it got put in, it pussed out. Yeah. And I bought it myself. But from personal experience, as I turned up the, you know, the, the, the protocol, and, and so now there's a guy named Reggie Edgerton and this guy Chet here at University of Washington. There, it turns out the Russians were onto this long ago. And the Russians were using stimulation of electrical stimulation through to the spinal cord. And now they have a unit that they're working on down in LA as a transcutaneous stimulator, but they don't have all the parameters put out yet. But it's like stim pacing the diaphragm, and the diaphragm starts working. Yeah. Walking people who are incomplete, and their legs start working. I mean, we've had literally two patients who were headed to nursing homes go back home after spending three months walking with our exoskeleton. So there's something going on in the spinal cord with regard to new synapses that we don't yet understand. Yeah, because this girl just had, you know, phrenic nerve stimulation, and I, I always can't help when I see her, because she'll come see me every so often, that, you know, that didn't have anything to do with it, because she was the most dense spinal cord, and at 10 days, I, I don't expect any recovery, and she re recovered. John. 
just on that note, I think we heard the comment that for plasticity to be optimal, it takes a lot of repetition. And if we if we get that down right, then we're going to enhance plasticity. So I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And to come back to your comment, I think NA, NIH, the venture capital model is all wrong. It's completely wrong because it eliminates the human element. Exactly. And this is all about the human element. And that's why we're in this room. So I think groups like the NIH endowments, big, big money is where we need to big real money, not, not profit, is where this needs to go. So again, the, the learning points from you are the following. First of all, uh, you're an amazing human being. I always thought no, of you. Focus and, on spinal cord injury. Uh, what and that's do. the point. Again, so I'm very glad you're willing to carry this message out there. For me, the main learning point is uh, to keep moving literally as much as you can. And uh, personally, I don't see a reason, I'm repeating myself, here, why we keep patients who have some form of paralysis in beds or in wheelchairs. We should try to move them and mobilize them as much as possible. And I think all of us together should try to band together and lobby whatever we can, however we can do it, to try to make a difference. Secondly, the spinal cord as such is, I think, one of the most under-evaluated organ systems in our body. Uh, that starts with neuroimaging, where we're still in a primitive era of pixelations on the MRIs. We don't understand really why what happens. We saw several cases where we were puzzled. This is a very coarse thing, and again, the cross-sectional diameter uh, era that we're all raised in, I think, is over. We have to really think about the 3D. Hence, I'm very excited about what Shane and colleagues here are doing, and hopefully with everybody's support here. And uh, finally, again, uh, every human being is different. I mean, everybody has a story. We try to classify things. John gave us a very eloquent review of classifications, but truly, there's a story behind every human being. So this is, again, the, the key thing. Everybody's different. We need to have a tailored approach somehow on the wisdom of groups that comes together. Those are my kind of brief summaries. Any other thoughts? Otherwise, Ed, thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you, you guys so much for, for listening. coming. So.